Alrighty, Cherubs, today we're talking uh, the Roman Republic. We've made it to Rome, and this is our last stop in the ancient world uh, in the West before we uh, get to the medieval period. So, hey, Rome. I have this love of Rome that kind of happened, um, Roman culture, Roman um, society, Roman learning. I, it's fascinated me since, gosh, I was in seventh grade and started taking Latin classes. And so Rome has this special place in my heart. And so I took Latin classes for a couple of years and um, then moved on and started taking Spanish. But just learning about who they are and their connections to us and um, why they still matter, it, it changed um, how I see the world. And so every year when we talk about Rome, it, it kind of brings a, you know, it happens in the fall and, you know, we come back to school and it just, it just uh, activates these like uh, very nostalgic places in my brain. So I'm excited to be talking about Rome with you uh, today. So you want to make sure that you take your quiz uh, on these pieces. Now, today's theme for the Roman Republic is verism and restraint. And we're going to be talking about what those mean in the context of art. So, yeah, just write that down in your notebook. Uh, some vocab for your convenience. All right. And that the one that you're really wanting to see is veristic down there at the bottom, and I can't get rid of the, the doodads. So we've only got two pieces today in the Roman Republic. We've got a bust, and we've got uh, a house. Kind of interesting pieces, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll explain. So the key dates of Rome look like this. We've got the Republic, and the Republic trucks along for a good you know, 600 years with uh, pretty, pretty peacefully. And then all of a sudden they erupt into this um, 50 year period of civil war and which threatens to tear the, the society apart um, and to transition out of that, to regain stability. That's how the empire happens. And we'll talk about that more next time. So the empire happens as a way to end the period of civil wars and they've expanded to the point where they are they just have to claim that they're an empire they they just have to say it now because they were um so we got the early the high and then the late so we've got about a thousand years worth of history to cover with rome rome bridges the ancient and the, the medieval world and so much of what our access to the ancients comes to us through Rome. Um, and we do so many things in our lives and in our culture and our society because they did them, because the Romans did them. Um, and they're really our touch point for, for Greece and for other ancient societies. So. It, Rome for us is very salient. It's very important and uh, very pertinent. Okay. I do want you to watch this. It's a history of kind of the founding of Rome up until the Civil War period. And so please go ahead and give this a watch. I think it's a 12 minute uh, video, but it just to lay the groundwork. And we're going to be watching this in class. But this is a, uh, yeah really, really good summary of what Rome, how Rome got to be Rome. Okay. And I just want to touch on some of the things that we get from Rome, just so you can see their importance. Okay. We get our alphabet from the Romans, right? Our Latin alphabet comes from the Romans, the newspaper, the concept of a newspaper comes to us from the Romans. 
our system of government comes to us not from Greece. It comes to us from Rome. We are a republic. We are not a democracy in the United States. So we have a republican system of government, and that comes to us from Rome, where we elect representatives to um, vote for us. That's Roman. Mass entertainment on a colossal scale, that's Rome. Sewers, drinking water, running water, plumbing, that's Rome. Toilets that flush away your undesirables, that's Rome. The three course meal, that's Rome. Painted portraits, that's Rome. The idea of the bust, and we'll talk about the bust today, that's Rome. Glassware, that's Rome. Mosaics, okay? So I mentioned in class, when we we're talking about the Alexander mosaic, this is a mosaic that has half eaten food uh, on it. And it's so remember mosaics for the Romans were on the floor. And so this was the dining room floor. And so I know that um, my kids in our dining room, like half the food doesn't make it into their mouth, you know, so <laughs> it winds up on the floor as we're constantly sweeping and mopping, trying to clean up after our kids. The Romans just made a mosaic of half eaten food on the floor so they didn't have to. <laughs> I love the little wishbone. That's so awesome. Um, in a in a the entranceway to a house they found a, in Pompeii, Cave Canum, with this growling dog on a chain. It literally means beware of the dog. <laughs> We've got a dog. Watch out. Mosaics again. This is a mosaic. I took from Disneyland when I, the last time my family, we were in Disneyland and it was outside the little mermaid ride. And there she was, you know, so they had these mosaics, um, of mermaids and such outside. And I just snapped this picture thinking like, ah, oh, yeah, mosaics were still, they're still part of our lives. Okay. So Rome is going to begin, remember on the edge of the Etruscan land. Um, the Romans, in the fourth century are going to start conquering Eritrea. They're going to start conquering Etruscan lands to the north. And they're going to start then conquering the Samnites to the south, to the south, excuse me. And so they're going to start to expand there in Italy very, very, very slowly. It's a slow burn. Okay. Um, we had seven kings in Rome from Romulus to um, the last guy, Tarquin the Proud. And they're going to be overthrown by, uh, by the Romans. And they're going to say like, okay, kings are not our friend. Okay. We don't like kings. Um, one of the, the people that helped oppose the king was a guy named Lucius Junius Brutus. Okay. That's going to become important here. Um, so what you're going to get is a system, it's a Republican system, a system of elected magistrates and representatives um, and assemblies to um, make laws, etc. They're going to have separation of powers, uh, separation, you know, checks and balances, etc. We're going to have two consoles. And again, if you watch the video, this is just review now. Um, you're going to have two classes as well. You're going to have the patricians and you're going to have the plebeians. And that becomes important too. Okay. We're going to have the Romans start to, the Greeks have this, um, they've, they've conquered, they're living in the lower part of Italy and the Romans are going to come in contact with them and have various wars with the Hellenistic Greeks. And so they're going to uh, uh, come in contact with them and start to love their culture and start to bring back their um, 
statues and things and start to replicate with a twist um, the Greeks. So <clears throat> Rome really isn't great at innovating things, but what they really are good at doing is absorbing what other people are doing and synthesizing it. Um, so they're going to take things from the Etruscans, and we talked about a little some of the things that the Etruscans do. Um, they're going to take things from the Etruscans, and they're going to take things from the Greeks, and they're going to take things from the Egyptians, and they're going to throw it all in a blender. And that's Rome. Okay. So the rise of Rome looks something like this. So when it changes from red to purple, that's when it changes to the empire. So here we go again. Here's red. The Republic, the Republic, the Republic, the Empire. And then the Empire is going to split as it declines. Okay. That's just a little gif on the, the rise and fall of Rome. I can watch this endlessly. It's fascinating. On the borders shift. Okay. So what's in a name? I mentioned briefly the two classes of people, the plebeians and the patricians. The patricians are the class, the nobility. Okay. They've got, um, noble ancestors. Okay. They come to be noble by helping to overthrow the Etruscans, helping to oust the uh, Tarquin, the proud. So they come, it comes from the Latin word pater, which means father. So this is the root of all of our words like patriarchal and, um, uh, patriotism, love for the fatherland, uh, patriarchal is, you know, father or male centric. Okay. It comes, uh, you know, and again, patriotism, if you're a patriot, you love your fatherland, right? So the patricians are the noblemen because they have noble male ancestors. All right. So a patrician then is, is, are the wealthier people, the nobility, the nobility. And it goes back to tracing your roots back to those noble uh, houses that helped to oust the Etruscans. That's what a patrician is. And a plebeian, a plebe, and I, I hear the word bandied about as like a, you know, we, we use the word today, but uh, I hear a uh, student saying pleb. It's plebe. Okay. Um, so we got our plebeians and our patricians and eventually in the Republic, they're going to be seen, uh, they're going to get the plebeians are going to be able to work their way up and become equal to the patricians. But if you're a patrician, you've still got like, aha, noble ancestors. And that's going to directly impact what we see here in just a second. So for example, the, the Brutus, the Lunius, uh, Julius, uh, Lucius Brutus, excuse me, that we saw just a minute ago that helped oust Tarquin the Proud. He, his descendant is going to be Brutus that um, helps to assassinate Julius Caesar and to Brute when and even you, Brutus, Caesar says as he's stabbed by his friend, um, even you at to Brute. So we're getting this, um, and, and Brutus there is a patrician, and he's a patrician because he's related, he's a descendant of this earlier Brutus who helped oust Tarquin the Proud. Okay, and so being able to trace your your forebearers becomes an important part of Roman society, um, part in the in the Republic era, because it means that you you've got the clout, the social standing to say yes, I am important. The three-tiered name that we have, I forgot to mention that earlier, the three-tiered name, first name, middle name, last name, family name, that's Roman, okay? So our first piece comes to us, again, from Italy, and it's this. It's the head of the Roman patrician. Now, the Roman patrician, so again, is the noble ancestor. And what they're going to be doing is, rather than creating a full statue for like the Greeks are doing. The important part for the Romans was the head. Okay. Because it's a portrait. Now, if we take a look at the Roman patrician here, you can see what they're doing. And 
they're not glorifying this guy really at all. He's uh, so as we age, our noses and our ears continue to grow. And so that's what they're representing here. You're getting a, a, a very large nose and very big ears because he's an older gentleman. He's got these sunken cheeks. He's got wrinkles. He's got, um, you know, he, this is not a young or idealized man. He's old. He's bald. Okay. So this is, the Romans are doing a couple different things here. Okay. They are creating a portrait to demonstrate that this is their noble ancestor. And again, rather than having these full-size statues, because that's not the important, the body isn't the important part. For the Greeks, it was the important part. Um, for the Romans, it's the head, because the head and shoulders, this is showing you who that person is. So they're going to display, and it, so they invent the bust. They're going to um, display the bust of their noble ancestors in their house, so that when guests come over, they can say, I, oh, I didn't quite realize you are related to so-and-so. So and so, and they say, oh, yes, this is my esteemed line of noble ancestors. Here we've got Gaius, here we've got Marcus, here we've got Licinius, etc. Does that make sense? Okay, and so that's what they're doing here. And so they want an accurate portrait of that person, warts and all. And that's what verism is. Veristic. That's what that word in the theme means. This portrait is veristic. They're trying to be, and it comes, and it's related to the Spanish word verdad, verdad, truth. Okay, uh, they have the same Latin root. It's a truthful portrait. Verism. Okay, wrinkles, warts, all of it. They're going to be showing it because that's important. So it it's a recognizable likeness of the person. And that's what's happening here with this head of the Roman patrician. Okay. He is a noble ancestor that was displayed, whose portrait was displayed in the house of a person in, yeah, Roman society. So here are various busts of noble ancestors. And here actually is a statue of a guy holding the busts of his noble ancestors. So it's like two for the price of one, right? Three for the price of one. Actually, you got two busts and a, and a person. Does that make sense? All right. So here are our notes. He's got those deep crevices in his face and he's, and he's the the look is meant to display wisdom and experience and um age to the venerated old age because these were people that um had lived a good long lifespan and had plenty of of experience and wisdom to pass on all right so that's the roman bust now let's look at the houses. Now, best preserved houses are coming to us from Pompeii. And we know what, how that story ends. It's like when you start talking about the Titanic, like, ah, yes, I know where this is going. Okay, so here are um, two clips that I want you to watch. What this one is on, and I'll, again, link this down below or on the next page. What this one is, this one is going to um, talk to you about, it's just going to show you the destruction of Pompeii like kind of this, it's going to check in on certain times throughout the day, like four or five different uh, moments throughout the day. So you can see how the destruction is progressing. And what you're going to see here is um, how they found the bodies. The bodies were eviscerated. Okay. Um, but their forms were preserved in this really odd and quirky and kind of macabre way. So go ahead and check this out. Right. Roman houses. Okay. Roman houses don't have windows. They're going to be built right up to the street like this. OK, 
change. You can see a little bit of a sidewalk there, but they're going to be built up to the street. Uh, if you're noble, you've got a villa, you've got a house. Okay. If you're poorer, you're going to be living in an apartment building. Okay. Um, you don't have windows really, especially down on the, you can, if they're more than one story, you can have some windows, but you don't want windows on the lower floor because what's going to happen is you're built up right up to the street. And remember plate glass still isn't a thing. Okay. It doesn't start to become common until, uh, later. So we don't want windows down here to, to let in the noise and the smells and the dirt from the, um, from the outside, from the streets. Okay. So you can see here, here's a Roman street. And again, the houses are built right up to it. Again, our, um, you can see how they've got, how much lower the streets are. Then they've got these crosswalks. These are crosswalks. You can get across the street because they would have been filled with, um, trash and sewage, uh, as far as like people dumping out, um, their waste from their windows. Okay. Yeah. The Romans do have sewage. They do have sewers. They do have plumbing, but this is, that's for like the upper crust, like the, the nobility. This is like the, the, the creme de la creme. This is not an affordable thing. And often you're going to have those things in public buildings. Okay. You're going to have toilets and running water, etc., in public buildings, not in your private house. All right. So that needs to be noted. So you're not going to want, so you can imagine the smell coming out of these sewer laden streets and, um, you don't want that in your house. You're not going to have any windows. Okay. So the typical fancy, again, this is a fancy Roman house, but a typical fancy Roman house is going to have a, a place for business up front and you're going to have the vestibule, the entrance right here. Here's the, the street, here's the street level and here's the sidewalk. Um, you walk in and there's, this is going to be the atrium. The atrium is going to be this, uh, receiving room. All right. And it's got the angled in roof called the compluvium and it allows, and it's open to the sky and it allows rainwater to come in and it channels the rainwater down into this pool called the impluvium. All right. Where you can wash up before proceeding further into the house. It's not, it's not a bath per se, but you can just like wash your feet, wash your hands kind of thing. Um, and you move through the house. Bedrooms are going to be off of the main area. You move off into the back and this is where you've got your garden and it's surrounded by the peristyle, right? Dining room, kitchen, that's all back here as well. So the parts of the house that you should know are the atrium and there is a flashcard for the atrium. So you walk in and it's this room, it's the receiving area to the room. Now you can see the stairs. Again, some Roman houses are going to be multi-storied. So you walk in and it's this receiving room. You can see the mosaics on the floor too. The impluvium is going to be this pool of water. Here's a reconstruction. Here's one that actually exists in Pompeii. So you can see it's not a swimming pool. It's not like a place to like take a bath, but it is a place to like rainwater collects there and you can use it. You wouldn't just stick your feet in there. You would use it. There would be like a basin and a table and you would use the water to wash up. Okay. Before tracking in your gross, dirty feet from being outside into the rest of the house. Then the, the rest of the, the back part of the house is separated. You got your bedrooms and such off to the front or excuse me, off to the side here up front. And then to the back, you can see the garden and the peristyle and that peristyle and the garden are back there. So you're not going to have a yard. This is the yard. It's so it's inside outside again, open to the sky. 
your yard for, um, you know, enjoying nature. That's, but that's going to be inside your house. So those are the parts of the house that you should know. And again, our best preserved examples are coming to us from Pompeii and they were preserved to us by that volcanic ash. Okay. Now the house that we're going to be taking a look at is called the house of the Veti. Okay. Um, it was owned by two brothers in Pompeii. It was an older house. It was an older villa and then they rebuilt it. And just in time for it to get wiped out by the volcano. <laughs> um, so here we have our entrance. So you can see it's a little more, we've got m m other rooms, okay? Rather than the, the garden being like that example I showed you back here. Okay, so it's not just a rectangle. It's a little more complicated than that, the house of the Betty. All right, and we've got stairs. So we've got our entrance and our atrium and our impluvium come to the back and we've got our peristyled garden. You can tell it's a peristyle because it's got the little dots here. Those are columns, remember. Okay. Now, because there are no windows, what they're gonna do is paint in fresco on the wall and they're gonna steal the idea of the fresco from the Etruscans. And we talked about frescoes, we talked about painting on wet plaster, we talked about um, what that means and why you would do that. So the Romans are going to steal that technique from the Etruscans and they're going to use that so to create these scenes. Sometimes they're going to be like pictures on the wall, just like we would hang pictures on our walls. So they're going to tell stories um, on the walls, but then they're going to have these other cut out little windows to show the outside. And they're, so they're just going to show architecture or nature outside. Um, and they're using this perspective, this linear perspective to show us depth. Oh, they're so good. And they're going to go through different styles. We're not going to talk about the different styles of Roman wall painting. That's a little too much for this course. Um, if you want to learn more about that, take more art history in college where they go through, they've identified four different styles and, uh, of wall painting in, in, in Roman society. So they allow um, people to bring the outside in. It lightens up the room. It makes the room more livable, more palatable, less dark, um, full of color, more spacious, a bigger space, because they're going to be using concrete to help build their things. Um, I We watched this. You should have watched this with the Etruscans. I will link it again just for your convenience, the science of fresco painting. So again, here's our peristyle garden. And go ahead and take a tour of this Roman house just to kind of walk through it. So we're in the atrium in this in this uh, thumbnail. We're in the atrium here with the impluvium and the gardens in the back. Okay. So the house of the Veti is an axial design, which means it is a rectangular design. Um, and it's sandwiched between the shops that they're going to own and up front. All right. And again, it's, it's designed to be a sanctuary. It's designed to be a place to shut out the noise of the world. It is a house. Um, and the house for the Romans becomes a place of, uh, importance. They're going to see the home as a place of societal importance that the, the home and the family hold society together. And if you hear that rhetoric echoed even today, that the home and the family are super important, um, to holding together society that comes from Rome. That's a Roman idea. Okay. They are going to offer rather they are going to have, um, temples and such that you can worship at, but most of the worship is going to be in the house. All right. They are going to have altars and things in the home that you, that's where you're going to do most of your worship, uh, and devotion is within the, the confines of your own home. So we've got the atrium open to the sky with the impluvium catching the rainwater. Uh, the cubicula are the rooms, the bedrooms, they radiate it out from the atrium. Okay. Um, the, again, this is an Etruscan design. They're going to conduct business. You're going to receive guests in a Roman house. Okay. And again, most of what we know is coming to us from Pompeii. Most people would have lived in apartments. 
some bonus material about Rome, things that you need to know. Now, Roman style, like I said, is going to be a, uh, a blender of Etruscan and Greek. So you can see the Etruscan temple and you can see the Greek temple. Um, the Etruscan temple has a porch. It has one access point and a porch and no columns around the back. All the columns are up front with a oversized roof and a small pediment. The Greek temple is going to be accessible from all sides. It's going to um, have regular columns throughout, more regular. So the Etruscans use less columns. The Greeks use more columns. And they're going to be go all the way around. The colonnade extends all the way around the building. The Romans are going to split the difference. Okay, What they're going to do is create a, an Etruscan um, style so that it has a porch and one access point. But they like the look of the Greeks, so they're going to trim down the roof line, make the pediment just a little bit bigger, and extend the colonnade all the way around. But you can't access the building here because it's a Etruscans, what they're going to do, but they're going to extend these columns around. And this kind of column is called an engaged column. It's round. Like in, if when you get engaged, you wear a round wedding ring. An engaged column is rounded as opposed to a pilaster, which is flat. So I hope you can see the, how Rome, a Roman temple is pulling from the Greeks and the Etruscans to create this hybrid. Okay, and they very much were a hybrid society. The innovation that that Rome contributes is concrete. And with concrete, they're going to be able to build their empire, their monuments. Now, remember that concrete and cement are not the same thing. Cement is a, a component of concrete that concrete uh, cement, you need an um, and something to bind, help bind it together. And so you're going to put in either sand or rocks or things to, uh, sometimes they're going to use um, old pottery or complete pottery. Um, and they're going to mix it in with the cement to get the concrete. Okay. So again, you need aggregates, stuff you add to it to make it concrete. Okay. Some of the things that the Romans were made with made with concrete, you do need to know these. You don't even need to necessarily make the flashcards today, but we are going to need to know these things. So we've got columns. And they're going to build out of concrete and then just face with marble because um, it's cheaper that way. We still do the same thing for the exact same reason. Okay, the Greeks are going to build out of marble. They're going to build a Parthenon out of marble. But as we know, that was fantastically expensive. Okay, that's the ex even for the Greeks, that was the exception. The Romans are going to do the same thing, like marble for the the most important buildings. But normally, when you're building something, you're going to be making it out of concrete. You're making artificial stone. That's the, and you can pour it and make it into a shape. And that's the beauty of concrete. Uh, so they're going to make things out of concrete and then just face them with marble to save money. So we have columns, we have pilasters, and we have engaged columns. Okay, so I'm throwing this new one out to you today. Columns are full round. An engaged column is like a bas relief column. And a pilaster is a squared off flattened column. We have the arch. The Romans are going to finally give us the true arch. And with it, they're going to build like crazy. So you don't have to build um, a solid wall. You can build it, it, the arch lightens the, the load. It lightens the, so you can go taller. It um, channels the weight down. So you can yeah build taller, build bigger, build longer. Um, this is an aqueduct to carry water from the mountains into the cities. They're going to use arches, so you use a lot less material, so it's a lot less expensive. 
Um, they're going to make triumphal arches and that type of monument still exists. And if you take an arch and you extend it out, that's going to be called a barrel vault. Okay. You take an arch and you, you make it three dimensional. That's a barrel vault. And you can use that to help support the weight of the roof. Now, when you take a barrel vault and you crisscross it with another barrel vault, that's called a groin vault. Again, a great way to help channel the weight, open up a space and make it sure look pretty. We still use these today. When you have a groin vault next to a groin vault, next to a groin vault, next to a groin vault, that's called this, it's called a fenestrated sequence. And if you take an arch and you spin it around, you get the hemispherical dome. So we're going to be seeing all of these things as we move down through history. So you are going to need to know these terms. Um, they are going to come back to haunt you. <laughs> so if you want to make the flashcards now, great. If not, that's okay too. Okay. The Republic is about truth, showing truth and restraint. You're showing that you have good family values. You're showing that you are a good citizen of, of the Republic, that you're good, that you're moral, that you make good choices. And that is, um, as composed compared to the empire where we're going to get, um, conspicuous building, conspicuous spending of money. All right here. They're like, Okay, they're 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 a little more humble, and that's what the uh, the republic is about. Okay, and that's how it affects their art. So that is it for today. I hope that that was instructive for you, and uh, I'll see you next time when we talk about the empire.